I'm going to tell you about some of the uh, ghostly happenings that have occurred over the years at Connor Castle. And I've got a story to tell you about one ghost in particular. It was a ghost. Several years ago, I was uh, wandering through the centre of Nottingham, uh, the oldest part, the bit that used to stand within the city walls, quite close to the castle. And I came across this narrow alleyway, went down it, and when I got to the end, it opened out into a street, a street of shops. But there's something very strange about this particular street. For a start off, it was a Saturday afternoon in the heart of a bustling city, and yet it was deathly quiet. And I was the only person around. And the other thing was that all the shops were closed. And I knew they were closed because they had wooden shutters across them, not the modern roller steel shutters. They were wooden. And in fact, all the shop fronts were made of wood, painted. And even the signs of the shop fronts were hand-painted in, in old copper plate lettering. Everything looked very old. And I say all these shops were closed, with one exception. Because right at the end was a shop that didn't have its shutters up. But when I went up to the windows, I could just see through the grimy glass that this shop was full of antique furniture, jam-packed to the rafters, and bric-a-brac of all descriptions and all ages. And I noticed there was a hand-painted sign on the door that said, Open. So I opened the door and went in, and it had one of those bells that rings to let the shopkeeper know that uh, he's got a customer. And when I got inside, it was really gloomy. In fact, it, it, it almost seemed candlelit like the room we're in now. And it took me some minutes to get used to the gloom. And I kind of nervously said, hello, is anybody there? And after what seemed an eternity, a figure came out of the shadows. And it was a little old man. He was bent almost double, incredibly old. And he had long, straight hair down to his shoulders. And I said, do you mind if I look around? And he said, be my guest, have a good look around, and see what can find you. Which I thought at the time was a strange expression. <laughs> so I did, and I must have spent hours in this shop. It was room that opened after room, passageways, it was a real warren. And after a while I got to what I thought was the end of the shop. And on a chair was this pot. Here, it's this very pot. And when I picked up this pot, I knew I was holding something that was extremely ancient. So I went to the shopkeeper to find out if he knew anything more about it. And as soon as he saw it, he said, Ah, I've seen you found the Templar's Grail. And I said, Oh, what's the story behind that? He said, I'll tell you. He said, Many years ago, I was walking through the city, a place that was then very different from now, so different you wouldn't recognise it, and it was much smaller for a start. And he said up ahead of me, in the street, propped up against a timber frame building, was a beggar, and at his feet he had a cap that he was hoping people would drop coins into. But this beggar had such a look of despair and hatred on his face, that passers-by, as soon as they saw him, were crossing the road to avoid him. Well, I took pity on him. And I went up and dropped a few coins into his cap. And he looked up at me and fixed me with a hard stare that seemed to delve into my very soul. And he said, One good turn deserves another in a very distinct Scottish twang. And he said, Many years ago, I was a warrior in a land called Outremer, the land beyond the sea. And he said, when I was in the middle of the desert, parched with thirst, I would reach for this jar, and the water it contained was always cold and fresh, no matter how hot the sun was beating down. And he said, take it, this is yours. And he fixed me again with a st that hard stare, and I didn't think he was a man to refuse, so I took the jar and left and put it on that chair, and it's been there ever since. Well, as soon as I heard this story, I, I really wanted this jar. And I said, that must make it over 900 years old. And the shopkeeper said, oh yes, I can vouch for it being over 900 years old. <laughs> well, I said, well, how much will you take for it? And he said, oh, it isn't for sale, but 
I'll give it to you for free, on the one condition that you return it to its rightful owner. Well, I wanted this jar, and I didn't think how on earth am I ever going to return something to an owner that's been dead for over 900 years. So I took the jar and left. A couple of years ago, we um, started writing a guidebook about Cobham Castle. And in there, there's a chapter that tells about the ghosts <coughs> that are sent to haunt this place. And one of them is a Knights Templar. And the story goes that this man, after many years of campaigning in the Holy Land, the land that was then called Outremer, the land beyond the sea, he yearned to return to his native Scotland. And after many months of travelling, he arrived at the gates of Codner Castle, half starving, suffering from battle wounds, exhausted, and he asked for shelter for the night, and they granted it readily. But alas, that man never saw the dawn, because he died that very night. It's said that those that have the misfortune to come across his ghost will be met by a stare so full of pure despair and hatred that they are chilled to their very bones. So, I'm going to leave this pot on this chair and we'll see if its owner returns tonight to reclaim what is rightfully his. There's one postscript to this story. I've been back to Nottingham many times and I've yet to this day failed to find that street of shops, the antique shop or the little old man. Is it true or not? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I'm going to pass you on to Trevor. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to pass you on to Trevor Middleton now, who's going to tell you about some of the, uh, the other ghosts that are sent to uh, walk the ramparts of Covent Castle. Thank you. <clears throat> How many of you knew the castle before tonight or before one of the other events? Have you ever taken a walk down here at this time of night? Yeah. Ever? Have you ever dared? Let's just be quiet for a minute or so. Just listen and look out of the windows. See what you can see. And listen to what you hear. Let's take a look outside. So you will be out there. Anyone? Is anyone sensitive to spirits? Anyone consider themselves sensitive to spirits? Has anyone ever encountered a spirit? Person over there in the hat. Yep. When was that? A lot of years ago. Well, when was it? It was actually at my house. Oh, well, I encountered a, an old lady mm -hmm. one night. We got woken up by some sort of white light. Mm -hmm. And there was like a Victorian dressed old lady right in front of me. And is your house old enough to have accommodated that lady once upon a yeah. time? Yeah. yeah, not really. Is that, is that a local house? Yes, yeah, in Swarry, but it's built where the old oh, prisoner wow. of war camp is. Right. Ah, yes, the prisoner of war camp. Mm. Celebrated as being the only prisoner of war camp which had a successful escapee. <laughs> we do things properly without here, don't we? Well, my job, <coughs> my day job, is, as a journalist, I, I talk to people for a living. It's a great way to earn a living. I get to talk to people, have conversations with people, learn their stories. Doesn't matter whether they're famous, doesn't matter whether they're road sweepers. They're people, they have a story. And only last night, I was chatting to uh, a retired teacher who lives locally, lives in Ironville. And we got chatting about the castle. She didn't know I was connected to Cotton Castle in any way, shape, or form. And she said, you know, I daren't walk my dog in Cotton Park at night. Now, Cotton Park, the old park for Cotton Castle, the butts, Ironville. So we meet in the middle. Ironville's over there somewhere, I think. And uh, we kind of meet in the middle. But Ironville was intimately connected with Cotton Castle at one time anyway. So. Once upon a time, no boundaries. This was the center of the universe. Just as if you bought a map, or if you, you had the money to commission a map, Jerusalem was at the center of the universe, or the known world. This was at the center of your known world 
if you were a peasant. Your world revolved around the lord of the manor. Uh, this place, the castle at any rate, granted the vicar to Hena Church until 1476, so that's some idea of the hold this place had over local people. It was a local hub. It was a bustling community. There were people around. People died. Their spirits live on, particularly the troubled souls. There's a story that was in the local paper only in 1879 about the, the young man who was having a troubled home life. He was a local worker, worked at uh, the Butterley Works, the ironworks nearby, which gives Ironville its name. Scribbled a note in pencil as best he could. The standards of literacy they had in those days, which were very poor, stuffed it in his pocket and went and killed himself. He was found with his throat slit face down in a puddle, as his father had been 20 years before. Two troubled spirits, they're out there somewhere. Who knows, you may have encountered them this evening as you walked along the path. They're out there. They're looking for peace, for comfort, I'm sure, a lot of them. So maybe, as you get home tonight, just leave that security light on a little bit longer. <laughs> and as you leave the castle, as you leave the grass, just turn back. See if you can see any of those other spirits. Maybe Charlie's Scottish Knight Templar. Maybe that young man from 1879. Maybe one of the many other people who died <coughs> in the vicinity in the area, whether accidental deaths, whether suicides, whether battle-scarred veterans by the Knight Templar. Think of them as you leave this place. Turn back and wave uh -huh. and say goodbye to them because they're watching you. Uh -huh. to keep hold of you.
Yeah. Yeah. Mind over matter paranormal group. Now they've been investigating ghosts at uh, Cardinal Castle and Castle Farm um, over the last two years and uh, they come up to the farmhouse every Friday night and um, and they do their studies, don't you Simon? So I'm going to pass you on to Simon now, who is the team leader and he will be telling you about some of the findings of the ghosts of Castle Farm and Cardinal Castle. Thanks Simon. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Sorry guys, got to do this to make sure it's switched. There you go. Right. As Rocky says, my name's Simon. Um, I'm a co-founder of Mind Over Matter Paranormal, which was set up uh, two and a half years ago. The reason why it was set up is my other half wanted to prove to me that ghosts existed. Now, my religious beliefs say ghosts do not exist. Anything spiritual does not exist. Um, she took me on two ghost hunts. The first night, nothing happened, and I laughed and said, there you go, ghosts don't exist. The next night, now for those that don't know, I worked for Dovesha Police. I was a PCSO until January for nine years. Um, she took me to a prison museum in London and the, one of the hosts said to me, do you feel brave enough to stand and call out? And the calling out is asking the spirits to come forward if there's anybody there. So I thought, yeah, cocky that I am, I'll call out and nothing's going to happen. So 13 of us in a circle, holding hands, I stand there and I shout, if there's anybody there, come forward now. Bang, on the floor. Seven times that night I was knocked to the floor. And I cannot tell you what knocked me to the floor, but something didn't like me being there. Now whether it was an ex-prisoner, because they knew I worked for the police, I do not know. But after that I started thinking, yeah, maybe there is something to this paranormal lark, maybe there is something about ghosts. So out of curiosity, I said to my other half, let's yeah. set up Mind Over Matter Paranormal. What we um, do, most weeks at least one night we go out on ghost hunts or we go out and just do a study on a particular place here in the castle grounds we've had a french woman singing which was heard audibly unfortunately not on voice recorders which is a shame um, we've had the smell of fresh bread come wafting across here um, the smell of perfume as well that's in here the farmhouse even stranger We've had glass thrown at us from one of the windows. We've had doors slamming. We've had audible voices saying everything from hello to get out. Um, one woman was quite persistent telling us to get out. We caught on voice recorders somebody saying good night John, see you next week. Which beggars belief. Um, in a minute I will play you a voice recording of a little girl that was caught in the farmhouse. Um, we've also had witchcraft in the farmhouse and believe it or not recently we've had a few um, de demonic, I can't say that word, demonic attacks in the farmhouse. One or two members of the team have been attacked um, which has shook us all up a little bit and we've had to rethink our strategies. Um, some of you probably go on paranormal investigations, maybe part of a team. We use all kinds of different equipments from mm -hmm. things like voice recorders. I'll show you the basic equipment that we have. The voice recorder that's being rec that's playing record at the moment. So everything you say will be taken down use in the events. <laughs> radios, digital radios. These are quite fun because what happens with these things is they take out the scanning mode on the radio. And what it will do is it will constantly scan. Rather than stopping on a radio station, it will constantly scan and you pick up words, sentences, some of them quite, some of them not quite nice. We've had laughter, evil laughter through this machine. Um, my other half at a different venue to this was told to shut up. Quite plain and simply over the radio it said D shut up and it said it twice. D shut up. Now the reason why it did that was because she was asking, she was shouting, she was calling out in what is basically a male dominated environment. So yes, ghosts can be sexist if they want to be. This machine that was making noise just a minute ago, that's an energy machine. <coughs> now it's claimed that ghosts use energy. 
and they'll come forward using the energy in the building. What this does is actually pick up energy that's not there. There's a couple of other machines that we've got dotted around that do something similar. But the ideal thing about this is it's noisy, so you would hear it going off. Obviously, different types of video cameras. This is a night vision camera with a small IR light on. We normally have a massive great big IR light that will cover the whole of that. But because I've not got the power pack working this week, um, I've not been able to bring it with me. Obviously on here, this is the smaller IR light that we use when we go into buildings. It picks up a really large area of a building. Um, the camera itself is actually a um, action camera. So it would pick up anything and I can run down a corridor, screw my head off and it would pick everything up. <coughs> We've got a little machine. There's lights on that side. No, no, it's all right, I can see. <coughs> We've got a little machine here. Um, this is the baby version of the computerized machines. Now these machines, they have about 1500 words inside them or digitally inputted on them. And basically what happens is when they pick up energy, they start talking. Some of it is really useless. And basically what will happen is it will start talking with that very robotic voice. Now this has told one or two wonderful stories about the farmhouse, which we're trying to get verified. Um, it talks about death. It talks about murder. It's also mentioned about the possibility of... Um, it's also talked about the possibility talked about a murder that may have happened in the farmhouse. We thought it was a hanging. Yes, we know. We thought it was a murder, a uh, hanging. It turns out it could be a murder. You get there and play. Um, and then, basically, machines like this. This is my Kindle. We have a tablet which has a particular program on there that again was similar to this machine here. It would pick up energy, come up with voices. Sometimes it comes up with really nasty laughs which are quite eerie, especially at two, three o'clock in the morning. Now what I wanted to do, and I put a speaker on it so that hopefully you can hear, is actually play you the voice of a little lady. Now you'll hear my other half talking which is quite embarrassing because it sounds like she's got a really high-pitched voice. And then be beyond that is another <coughs> voice. Now obviously you, you won't all hear it at the same time, but I can come around and play it in different places. On the 4th of April of this year, telling us it's her birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is one of the newest areas really of the castle. Um, and this tree, although it may look uh, decidedly old, is in comparison um, quite a young um, slip of a tree. However, we call it our story storytelling tree. And uh, now I'm going to uh, pass it on to uh, another member of the trustees and uh, <laughs> another story for you. My name is Joan Fitzsaying. I'm the wife of the third Baron de Grey, Sir Richard de Grey of Codner. There was a, a lady who visited and she was heavily pregnant. She had a falling out with her husband and she decided to go for a horse ride. Not a very good idea in that condition. And unfortunately, the horse came back alone this lady visitor had been killed, thrown off a horse, and the baby died with her. And now she haunts our grounds. She's known as the Grey Lady. Perhaps you've seen her hidden away in one of the guardia robes or openings or on the battlements. Perhaps you've seen the Grey Lady, the lady who was killed out riding, heavily pregnant. Thank you. Ha 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 ha!